Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are glad to have you here together with us in this discussion where we will address the way through which FIFA is working in order to turn football more accessible and inclusive to, to everyone. A very special thank you also today to our guest speaker, to, to Ala, Ala Usta from Ala is the diversity and accessibility manager at, at FIFA and is here to, together with us today in order to share a little bit of her experience and her, and her work in, in this area. So thank you very much, Ala, for, for being today with us. And before going deeper into the, the discussion that I think that is it's what takes us all together here, here today, please just allow me to give a few words regarding our, our organization. So I'm here today on behalf of the Integrated Dreams Association that is a not a not for profit organization based in Portugal and that has as as main objective to promote the integration of of disabled people uh, through sports and and our 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 flagship project is the football for all leadership program that is a course designed to promote employability entrepreneurship and networking for disabled people in the sports industry and hopefully this program will, will be back in one year, so in October 2021. And in the meantime, um, we are organizing the, the Football for All Talks that consists in, in a series of free online webinars that take place every week and that um, address different topics linked to sports, disability and, and innovation. And before, just before passing the word to our, to our guest speaker, I'll just share with you our, our poll for, for our, today, our today poll today's poll and here I just I just shared it and the question that we have for today is regard regarding the inclusion of disabled people where do you think it should be the main focus of of FIFA and we have here five different options and I kindly ask if you if you could select one of them and then by the end of this session we will we'll share the results and then we can we can also have a global vision of of, of our of our feedback on this on this context. And now passing here the word to our, to our speaker, so to Ala. Thank you very much again for joining us today, Ala. And maybe as a, as a way to kick off this session and as a starting point, I would kindly ask if you could start by a little bit by introducing yourself and also the work that you have been doing at FIFA and a little bit the, the, the role of your, of your position inside the, inside the global structure of FIFA, inside the global structure organization. So thank you, Ala. Thanks, Josie, and thanks for having me as part of the Football for All uh, webinars. I'm really glad and proud to, to be here to, to share the work that we do. Um, and like Josie said, uh, my name is Hala Usta. I'm Diversity and Accessibility Manager at FIFA. Um, from my accent, you might uh, guess that I'm from Scotland. <laughs> so in terms of my journey, I, I started off as Diversity and Inclusion Manager at the Scottish Football Association, whereby we achieved the, the advanced level of the quality standard. Uh, this topic was very high also on our agenda and um, to ensure that we were embedding uh, diversity and inclusion across the association. And then uh, recently uh, in 2018, uh, I took up this newly formed role at, at FIFA in terms of diversity and accessibility manager, just in time for the, the Women's World Cup to ensure that, that the, the tournament was accessible and inclusive as possible. Um, and then working uh, mainly on the, the tournaments and events to ensure that uh, our events are as accessible and inclusive as possible to disabled people and people with limited mobility um, and really working on infrastructure for the tournaments on services um, and making sure that uh, everyone can enjoy the beautiful game of football. Great, no, great introduction. And we are, we are glad to have you here together with us, Ala. And, and as a way, maybe as a way a little bit also to start this, like, could you please share with us a little bit the current approach that FIFA has towards disability and which are the main concerns of, of FIFA in this area, like in a, in a general view, in a general view? Sure. Um, I mean, first and foremost, uh, I think I, I spoke about our commitment to, to ensure our events are as accessible and inclusive as possible and that football can be accessed by, by anybody at in different levels, uh, in different ways. Um, it's enshrined first and foremost within our disciplinary codes, within our statutes. If you look predominantly at uh, Article 4 in terms of uh, not tolerating uh, having zero tolerance for discrimination of any kind uh, and disability specifically being one of them. 
it's within our corporate uh, strategy, our vision and our statements and our publications um, in terms of making sure that the game is accessible for all. But then again, there's also my role, which has been created, which I think is a huge commitment by FIFA uh, to recognize that this is an area that's very important and that to ensure that across all levels of our tournaments, we are, are trying to make as best as possible uh, an environment that somebody can come to to enjoy the game and um, to feel part of the atmosphere. Um, and then even wider looking uh, across the board in terms of employability, in terms of equal opportunities, um, whether it's working, volunteering, um, or, or coming along to enjoy a game. So uh, it's not to say that we get everything right. We're learning and evolving all the time, but I think that's the beauty of it, is to at least start uh, and, and go on the journey. No, and it's, it's great. It's great that FIFA has created this position and that where, where you are working now, and also this area in general. And, and no, and it's great to see that such like um, an important body, like the main football gov governing body worldwide, like is caring about disabled people and, and that, that is working to, to provide a better access of this com these people to, to football and as spectators and, as, and in, in, a, in a general context. And, and here, like here, my question, like also for you is like, my next question is, FIFA is the, is the, is the main governing body for football worldwide is like is the is the organization that rule, rules football as a worldwide wide level, and um, and my and um, and here and and in FIFA inclusively FIFA has correct me if I'm wrong but if I'm not wrong FIFA has 211 national members so affiliated organization member associations, so I think it's probably one of the organizations with more with more national members, and my question here is as uh, as the governing body for football worldwide, is FIFA encouraging its national football football association, so its affiliated members, to like to for, by any sort of way to to promote strategies that that can pro, that can that can establish a better access of their local disabled people to football. So, so if at the national level, FIFA, FIFA is also contributing to to, to the change. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a very good point in terms that uh, it's a global uh, approach and we have to, to cater different regions of the world and different standards, different legislation, different cultures, different traditions. Um, and it's really not saying to, to the world, okay, you have to do this now uh, this way, but really understanding how we can help support um, and develop the, the national associations uh, to move forward and to enhance their offerings as well. Um, I think through the, the member associations department, uh, again, it's not just me, myself and I in this role, it needs support from, from other areas of the, the organization and from external stakeholders as well. But working with them, we, for example, have the FIFA forward funding uh, that's delivered to the national associations. Um, and as part of this is to encourage uh, uh, associations to, to look at this. I mean, previously we've held uh, accessibility workshops I think with cafe as partners to go and deliver uh, sorry <laughs> the noise there um, to deliver uh, capacity building uh, and awareness uh, and education to national associations to help them to understand as to if they are developing a stadium in terms of stadium design what to look for how to incorporate it how, how to make things accessible uh, from the beginning um, or if they're developing policies or procedures, how to consider that as well. So that's a big offering from the FIFA Forward uh, Member Associations Department. There's also something in the pipeline in terms of football stadium guidelines, which will offer checklists and advice for national associations uh, to incorporate and to embed accessibility principles across the, the different areas. Um, and then you probably know the, the FIFA Foundation uh, supports uh, a lot of organizations uh, in the community who are working with disabled people uh, and working with organizations around participation um, of football uh, in those different regions and countries. Um, and the confederations are also doing a, a fantastic job. Their support is very helpful. Um, and, and there's a few other projects in the pipeline that I can't mention yet, um, but will help towards in terms of uh, participation of uh, disabled people in para football. Good. No, this is great, and it's and, uh, and it's good to know that 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 things are moving, and that you are and that 
and that so many projects, like some some of them directly linked to FIFA, other in partnership with other organizations, with even with the with the confederations, with with also with the member with your member association. So it's great to see that that things are changing and that and that FIFA and in particular you also yourself are contributing for for change. And and when when I remember about FIFA, I remember about many many things. It's like it's such a a, a, a renowned organization. But the first, the first memories that I have from FIFA come, and I think it also happens the same with many people, come from the FIFA major tournaments. From I think we all have a match from a World Cup that, or or put it as crying or very happy that some that somehow mix it, mix it with our feelings. And and my question here, like considering here your main your major tournament, so. So here, even with a bigger focus in the men's uh, foot, uh, football World Cup and the women's uh, FIFA World Cup, also. So, considering your next major, the, the the ones that you are organizing in the coming years, so Qatar 2022 for men's, and Australia New Zealand for 2023 for for women. Um, what can we expect from from these tournaments in terms of of accessibility and inclusion in general of of disabled people? So. What 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 are you preparing for for these tournaments? Uh, I think it's important to to say that uh, accessibility tournaments didn't start when I started at FIFA. It started a long time before I came to FIFA in terms of my colleague Paula and the, the support from the the different departments as well. So I think uh, Russia uh, definitely was a huge benchmark for accessibility in terms of mega sporting events, um, and and what was delivered there was was brilliant for 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 the time. Um, for, for accessibility and for football as well um, and likely the same in that regard as the, the Women's World Cup when I arrived was also another opportunity to showcase um, and to, to advance uh, accessibility at, at tournaments and a, another learning opportunity for me to, to see how uh, big mega sporting events how to incorporate accessibility at that level because it's not the same as a club structure, it's not the same stadium. It's not something that you are always uh, situated in the same stadium and you can work in and you can improve. It is just a one-time event and then uh, moving on to another country. So that's a bit of a, a challenge there, but something that we, we relish, we, we try to ensure that we can uh, improve the, the standard and, and leave a legacy and sustainability behind. But for, for upcoming tournaments, for, for Qatar and for, for New Zealand uh, and Australia, it's something that's really exciting because we get to push the boundaries even more and we get to test even more to see how it works and the way I split it is usually in the three categories so the infrastructure we have in terms of what we're dealt with when we arrive to the host country and it's really about making improvements there whether it's the parking areas the accessible routes uh, the toilets the seating I mean we have uh, I think one of the few events that offer four categories of seating so your easy access standard easy access amenity, your wheelchair user place, and your easy access extra width. So that's something that, that we try to, to promote and obviously have uh, uh, complementary companions to, to support in those cases. Um, but it's really about the infrastructure, making sure that people can get into the stadium and once they're in the stadium, uh, they can access freely, uh, move, move about freely and enjoy the game and the atmosphere like anyone else. Uh, the other thing is the, the services that we provide. Uh, and I think carrying on from Russia is the audio descriptive commentary, uh, being able to provide that in, in the languages um, and to, to blind and partially sighted people is something that's quite important for us. Um, we have the, the hawker service in terms of the, the priority lanes as well and, and uh, volunteers to support us in there. We have the wheelchair escorting uh, and the, the shuttle services as well. So it's really pushing that. And I think for, for Qatar and for Australia and New Zealand will push the boat even further and uh, try our hand at maybe sensory rooms as well. Um, and we're learning a lot about that uh, in the meantime to make sure that we can also have a positive experience. We can give a positive experience um, for, for spectators. And then the last is the training, which I think is very, very important. So this is uh, across all the, the workforce, the volunteers, the staff internally uh, at FIFA between the different departments the staff uh, with the, the joint ventures, the, the local host country. Um, so that's a, a huge part of us that helps in terms of build capacity um, and, and leave a, a legacy as well within that country that we're visiting.
No, and, and this this point at this point that you were that you were touching, like in the end, it's a, the stuff. It's a really really important topic on on the training. It's a really important topic on on this context. And here, my my next question is a little bit linked. It's also also with this. And normally, so when you organize, for example, giving the case of of Qatar and 2022 and Australia, New Zealand. 2023 and also what happened in the last tournaments either with the women's uh, world cup in france and the men's in russia and normally you you work in collaboration with them with the local organizing committees and and my question here is is there on also on this side of promoting accessibilities and a more inclusive experience for disabled fans is there is it important is there any any collaboration also here on this side between fifa and the local organizing communities and also do these co do these committees do these organizations local organizations normally used to have also at least someone from their staff who is dedicated to to this area of promoting better accessibilities and better a better experience for for disabled fans or... uh, so for in the case of qatar uh, we have a joint venture uh, rather than a local organizing committee um, and that definitely is the case. We work with Q22 and with the Supreme Committee uh, to ensure that uh, we have that accessible and inclusive tournament. Uh, we have recently uh, recruited a social responsibility and accessibility manager. And I think this is a learning from previous tournaments as well, that it's very key to have somebody in that role on the ground that can support in terms of uh, pushing forward policies, procedures, but understanding the local context really understanding stadium design to, to help with the, the infrastructure aspects um, and to move things along. So that's been very key for us. Um, another thing is also understanding that the tournament is does not just take place in the stadiums. Um, and that's been uh, really helpful to have the, the joint venture uh, Supreme Committee to understand the host country aspects in terms of how that links up with the stadium. So not just when you arrive at the stadium with your ticket, but from the point of when you arrive at the airport, for example, getting into town, the accommodation, the transport, public transport, um, and the different attractions. And that's been something that's uh, high on the priority list and trying to collaborate and align as much as possible uh, with the, uh, to ensure a good tournament experience and event experience. Um, so definitely, I would say that the, the joint venture or local organizing committee is key and they do support a lot also, I think in the, the case of Qatar is uh, having the, the connection with the local uh, organizations who work with disabled people. Uh, it's always good to hear what the, the local culture and traditional norms are um, and how people, they know their city the best and they know their country the best. And they can also advise us uh, in certain aspects as to, to what they uh, enjoy or what challenges they may have faced before that we can support to to uh, to overcome whether it's tangible uh, or intangible uh, that's something that we're we're quite keen to to understand from them and i think in qatar it's the accessibility forum which is a group uh, which is made up of different organizations uh, accessibility organizations but also uh, disabled people themselves so they go to the stadiums they uh, have a look around do a mini audit for us and just report back on specific issues uh, especially during test events so it's good for us to understand before the World Cup comes into place, for example, uh, where there's maybe snagging items or issues that we can still improve on and still uh, make better. And then another key thing is having uh, their, their sounding board in terms of their input and learning from them, for example, for Qatar is the prayer rooms. It's not something we've experienced before in different stadiums around the world. So understanding from them in terms of uh, having accessible prayer rooms, well, what does that mean? the ablution areas, the, the washing areas, uh, is there a, a wheelchair user space in those and the, the location of the hand dryers. So it doesn't just stop at, for example, having accessible toilets, but increasing that and, and understanding in terms of uh, the prayer rooms, how we can make the, the whole journey uh, accessible for, for disabled people. No, oh, of course. Sorry, yeah. sorry, you were saying, um... No, and, and it's and it's definitely it's definitely also this this point that you are touching. It's a very important one. It's um, like to adapt to the to the cultural to the cultural circumstances and 
and you organize so FIFA organizes events a little bit around the world so probably it's also definitely a challenge for you to to adapt to to every culture and and but always independently of which culture which region of the world you are always with the with the focus and with the effort of of turning your events accessible and that and that everyone can can go to to a football match in particular in this case to to world cups either men either women and 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 I think that hopefully we we can have many many disabled fans in in Qatar 2022 and and in Australia New Zealand 2020 2023 and and here like considering like the um, the World Cup so the all the events like either the men's competition either either the women's tournament considering here the all event like normally it's they are like big events with many stadiums with many fan zones with like a big a big atmosphere around the stadiums. It's not only nowadays, it's not, you don't go only for a match just, just for the stadium. You have all an experience outside of it. And, and my, my next question is like, besides the stadium accessibilities, for example, for your future tournaments and probably you already have done it in your, in your former tournaments. Do you, do you have any activities in mind for like for engaging disabled fans and disabled people in general out without considering here just the stadium accessibility so for example do you, do you consider for example having uh, disabled football uh, sessions in in the fan zones or or having awareness activities or even even other kind of trainings related with this with the, in the in, in the context of this um, of these tournaments if there if you are also preparing to have other activities outside of the stadium um, I mean, a key thing that, that FIFA has is the, the fan fest areas where there is entertainment, where people will join together after the games or watch the games together there. Um, and it's key for us to, to make those areas accessible as well for everyone. Um, but depending on the country that we, we go to uh, and that we're in, it really it's something that's usually provided and organized by the local entities um, in terms of different activities uh, at, the, at these places or across the the, the country or the, the city. So it's something in terms of, uh, I think, organizations, local organizations that would uh, maybe create or display or that's something that we can support. But I don't think it's ever a good idea for us to, to come in and say, okay, well, we want an exhibition para football game just for the sake of it and drop with, with no support afterwards. So it's really something that I guess the community organizations would take uh, advice and support and guidance from them and that we would support them if they were something long lasting uh, within the within the, the city itself but not something that we would just pop up thank you goodbye <laughs> <laughs> no of course definitely definitely and and i suppose like you have big big expectations for your your future tournament so either qatar, either qatar 2022 either australia new zealand 2023 and which legacy are you expecting to last in in this country? So, how do you see these these tournaments also as changing points and as and as and and, and, as, and as tournaments that will contribute for for a better a better life quality and a more inclusive experience for local disabled people after the after the tournament? So, how do you see this uh, the legacy that this this the opportunity to last legacy in, with these tournaments? Um, I think it's something that you can probably find outlined in, in the sustainability strategy. For us, it's all about creating that sustainable and lasting legacy impact when we go in, especially around the, the topic of accessibility um, and whether that's the host country in terms of the, the wider offering of their public attractions or their accommodation or transport. That's energy that they put in and should be lasting beyond the tournament. Um, but for, for us, in terms of my role specifically, is within the stadiums. And for me, I get happy or I'm joyed when there's the lasting impact on the stadiums, when people can go and watch football, because football is what we, me and you, for example, why we're in these roles and why we love uh, working in these roles. But to be able to, I don't know whether it's the creation of adult changing facilities, which is not usually seen across the world, but is a new concept for some countries, being able to, to leave those as a lasting uh, legacy. Uh, I think one of the, the first things when I came to, to FIFA as part of the Women's World Cup is the audio descriptive commentary was uh, quite a nice example uh, in France where I think Lyon, uh, they still have it within their stadium and it's an offering that they still provide. 
So having that capacity building to those volunteers for them to continue beyond the, the tournament and for the stadium to continue as well beyond the tournament, I think is something that, that we're quite proud of and something that we intend to, to ensure uh, we achieve. No, it, it, it's great. No, and in, in this case of, of, of Lyon, it, for example, it's a, a really good example because after the women's tournament, they nowadays they still keep the, um, the ADC, the audio descriptive commentary. And it's it's a it's a positive it's, it was a positive impact definitely that the world that the women's world cup lasted in in that stadium and 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 this is always an opportunity like sometimes we have the tendency to focus a little bit only on on the on the tournament that takes around one month but then there is all an impact that comes afterward afterwards and that that it keeps and my my next question is a little bit linked now not so much for your for your future tournaments but but more focusing now on your on your most recent competition so even here on France 2019 so the last women's world cup and on the last men's world cup russia and russia 2018 and here like is there any success story any success case that you would like to share also a little bit of how did you see that these tournaments i know that for example in france we were just talking about the case of lyon but but also the case in russia i know that there are many many great stories about that the the world cup contributed for a more inclusive uh, situation for for disabled fans and will it be any success stories in these tournaments that you would like to share with us? Um, I mean, yes, definitely. There's always a, there's always something that positive that comes out of the, the tournaments and learnings that come out of the tournaments. And I think, uh, like I said before, but, uh, Russia was a benchmark for us in terms of accessibility. Um, and it couldn't have been done with uh, uh, the people on the ground who helped and supported and the stakeholders who helped and supported. Um, I don't know if, uh, if uh, Elena's logged in to the call, but she, I think Elena and herself uh, is a success story. Um, she was there as part of the accessibility working group in Russia. And um, so was very in terms of hands on in the stadium, uh, providing feedback, being that sounding board, the same as the, the accessibility forum in Qatar now, um, but really involved uh, in the tournament. And I think uh, the success story there is uh, beyond the tournament, uh, the creation of a role, the disability access officer within the, the Federation itself to continue her role and to continue to see the, the value uh, and commitment uh, after that tournament to ensure that disabled people continue to enjoy the stadium and the games um, and to use her expertise as a person with lived experience um, and to, to understand from her uh, and her networks um, where they can make improvements uh, in the stadium and in the city uh, and for I guess any visiting uh, countries because it's a, it's a unique role I don't think uh, outside Europe there are many disability access officers. I think uh, predominantly now they're, they're only at clubs uh, in the majority. There are some which uh, I think Joanna in the first uh, webinar mentioned uh, within Europe uh, that have the national uh, role. But outside of this, it's, it's very rare, but it's something that we would definitely encourage, um, especially now as part of uh, Qatar to have a, a similar role there or a, a supporters group. Uh, established there and it's something we'd like to see more uh, national associations take up with, with the right support as well. No, oh, definitely. The, and the, the story of, of Elena is simply incredible and by the way I don't know if she's following her as today or not but uh, also a special, uh, she just, <laughs> she just she sent a, a nice comment so, so also a special greeting here for, for Elena, for Elena Popova. And no, and, and, and it's incredible. Also, also this, the fact that that you that you don't organize only Europe um, only events in in one in one continent. Also here, it's a great opportunity for you to 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 expand to expand your knowledge around the world and to and to and to take a positive legacy not only to a specific region of of the world but a little bit to to around the world. And now as, and now I think you are organizing your next tournament will be in, in the Asia Confederation with Qatar and also. With Australia and then in, with Oceania, with um, with New Zealand, and I think there is also here a great opportunity. And we are very much looking forward not only for the football matches that will be thrilling probably, but also for the legacy that that sometimes we don't have the idea that how these competitions can change the, these countries and and also contribute for a better life experience of of the local people. 
and and it's really and, key like you said there it's uh it's the individuals themselves in these places it's not always the national associations that start it or the international federations that start it it's the local people who are quite passionate and committed for example like elena that are quite proactive as well and push for those positions and push for those experiences which are, are really important and do make a difference and with enough of those people then um, we can see a change as well with the, obviously the, the learning and the support from from ourselves as well no definitely no and the, the first step is is always the people that, that definitely totally totally agree agree with you and no and my my next question is a little bit also now concerning coming back again to your your future event so is it like for example if for countries who who plan to organize um, FIFA to apply to to bid to to FIFA major tournaments here, thinking more in the men's World Cup and the women's World Cup also, um, is it accessibility a requirement nowadays in the bid? Like, should a country that is planning to that would like to organize a men or a woman a women's FIFA World Cup um, should consider accessibility on like should it have as, as one of the key points in the bid and it, is it a requirement it's definitely key as part of the commitment it's definitely key uh i don't think we can go to to host a women's world cup or a men's world cup in somewhere that's not accessible so in terms of the bidding yes definitely um in terms of we analyze the country's legislation we analyze what currently exists there as part of the host the cities uh, and the, the stadiums itself uh, I mean, to give you an example, this morning I was up at uh, six thirty to <laughs> to log into the the workshops for the Women's World Cup in Australia and New Zealand uh, because of the time zones there. But that is uh, one of the threads uh, that underpin the whole uh, the whole tournament. I think sustainability and legacy, um, and you'll see with the the information that's included as part of the sustainability strategy. Uh, those initiatives and those uh, milestones are, are key to ensuring that, that we provide a, a tournament that is accessible and inclusive that meets the commitment that we've made. So I would say that yes, um, it's definitely something we look for. It's something that we can also support on. It's not that we would uh, uh, not support or not go somewhere because it doesn't have it, but we would look to embed it or to progress it within the country that we're going to but it has to be accessible for us uh, and inclusive of of disabled people people with limited mobility everyone everyone um has to be able to be able to enjoy football oh definitely definitely totally agree and i think here i think it's great that you have this in 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 consideration when when countries decide to to apply because I think if you want to organize a men's or a women's uh, FIFA World Cup or even depend any competition, I think you should you should do it for everyone and not only for um, for specific targets of your population. And and as these are ev every time more and more global events, the the World Cups, I think it should it's great that you that that this is is a key point also in in the bids for 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 applications for the World Cups like men's, women's and. It's really nice to see it. And my next question here is a little bit on on a different topic, so but still related with with football. And like con concerning the, the way how football is 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 developing a little bit around the world, like and also like we were we were talking like not like a few minutes ago that your events are more and more global. So nowadays you have events uh, around the world in in all different continents. Like how do you see the role of disabled people? in the future of the game and also here like like concerning like the future fifa events like f future fifa um, tournaments like how how do you see like the the possibility of having more like disabled people involved in these events or either by being employed in the events or by by doing volunteering or even by having their own projects that somehow can be linked or or can be partners of of fifa in this in, in these tournaments how do you see, like, can we expect having more disabled people involved in, in the future FIFA tournaments, like as, as employees, volunteers, or in any other kind? I mean, simple answer, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. No, definitely. I, uh, 
for our tournaments, uh, I think for as well Qatar coming up, it's going to be a real emphasis on volunteer recruitment to make sure that we have a very diverse uh, volunteer workforce that can support us in the stadium. And I think something that's important to, to mention, here, mention here is not just working on the accessibility aspects of the stadium, mm -hmm. but working across different topics uh, and subjects um, and different areas of, of the, the tournament. So while there will be uh, accessibility focused volunteers, um, to help out with the specific responsibilities. There's also a whole host of other subjects um, and opportunities. And I think the key thing for us is to provide equal opportunities to ensure that anybody who wants to come and volunteer um, has the opportunity to, to be able to, to enjoy it um, and have that inclusive experience. Um, and sometimes we'll ask, for example, on the, the re recruitment forms, do you, uh, do you have a disability? And it's not to discriminate, but really to understand where we can make reasonable adjustments in order to make that experience as inclusive as possible and enjoyable as possible as part of the, the wider tournament. Um, but I don't think it just stops at the, the volunteering. There's a, in terms of applying for roles, staff roles, uh, the, the roles that are happening in Qatar at the minute and that will be happening for future tournaments. Um, if you have the skill set and if you have the passion and the knowledge and expertise, then the, there's opportunities for you there. And there are plenty of disabled people uh, working within the, the game of football and on the tournaments as well. We have right. in terms of uh, opportunities there, but it's just uh, really finding the, the area that you're interested in um, and having uh, the confidence to apply. Um, but also not just uh, putting the emphasis on those who want to apply, but really working on our policies and our procedures. Um, to make sure that the recruitment uh, is enhanced and the equal opportunities are considered and, and really working uh, on ourselves as well. So I think it's a two way, two -way uh, street here that we need to, to work to target and market um, specific communities to encourage them to apply and to let them know that the opportunities exist um, and those uh, communities need to, need to apply as well. Great. No, no, it's, it's encouraging and, and it's good that you have in mind also this, this idea of turning the workforce more and more diverse. And no, this, this, I think we have here some, some encouraging words from your side. And my last question before passing to the, the questions from, from our audience, my, la my, last question, my, my last question aims to turn this even a little bit more, more encouraging for, for our audience. And I know that we have here quite, quite a good, a considerable group of, of disabled people who love football and who would love to work in football following us, following us today and who have this dream of, of being involved in the football industry. And my question here is, is, like, is like, what would you say to a disabled person who has the dream of, of working in football? Like, how, like in some brief words, how would you, how would you suggest them to, to, to reach their dream? How would you suggest them to? Um, I mean, have the passion, have the commitment. Uh, if you love football, it shines through, but also depending on the area that you want to work in, is it accessibility? Is it marketing? Is it communications? Is it guest management? Is it finance? Is it human resources? Um, really understanding what your passion is uh, and then being proactive. Nobody's going to come to, to ask you if you want the job or to give you the job. You, you have to go and apply for it uh, and, and and make sure that your name is in the mix to be considered for the role itself. Um, I think building a network is very important. Uh, we always say that football is a village. Once you meet somebody, you'll probably see their face <laughs> 10, 15, 20 times again. Um, but it's, it's nice to have that network and to have people who can mentor you within the, the industry as well and support you and somebody that you can learn from and that you can also teach probably um, in that respect. But uh, definitely apply, uh, become an expert in your field as much as possible. And you can do that with your passion and your commitment. I mean, Elena has probably her dream job and um, I have mine and it's because of that commitment and passion um, that we strive for. I mean, 10 years ago, uh, women working in football was something that was strange for us. And it's something that we're trying to progress and enhance and looking at the intersectional aspect of, of diversity. Uh, you can have, uh, I don't know, uh, race equality, gender equality, LGBT, uh, all within the same disability uh, in one person, that diversity. So uh, it's something that we consider as well uh, to make sure that we have the, the structures uh, through recruitment to make sure that we are providing those equal opportunities. 
but also just, I mean, I'm a girl from Glasgow <laughs> now working in Zurich and getting to live the dream of working at the World Cup. And it's possible if you if you have that uh, ambition and passion to to make sure that you do it and share and shout about the good things that you do as well. I think to celebrate the positive stories um, is something that's uh, it's always nice to hear, especially in these times of COVID <laughs> uh, and just to, to create those networks. No, great. And it's good to see that, that the, door, the doors in FIFA are open for um, for disabled people and and it's definitely it's definitely encouraging to to hear this and and i think that someone like the people who are following us like clearly came out with a with the conclusion that impossible impossible is nothing so they just should try to to focus on their their areas of passion and try to become experts in these areas and then just apply and 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 try there because if with a little bit of, of like of practice and and of and and also a little bit sometimes of, of luck that also help, helps on this side. I think it will like the opportunity then ends up coming out. And, and now and and now we have here we have here a few questions from from our audience. We'll try to answer to the the most of them possible. And I'm sorry if if we are we are limited by time, so it might happen that we cannot answer to all the questions. But I would still like to say thank you to all the people who, who launched questions and feel free to continue to, to launch. A few, we still have a few more minutes to answer. So my, my, and my fir, my, the first question here for, for Allah comes from, from Joanna Deagle, who Joanna Deagle, the, the managing director of, of CAFE. So also a nice, a, a nice greeting to, to, to Joanna. Hello, Joanna. And her, the question of Joanna is for Allah, uh, can you share some examples of good practice by men, member associations or, conf, or confederations outside of Europe. And what role does FIFA play in sharing and highlighting these to encouraging to encourage more change? Um, I mean, I think that's key uh, to be able, like I said, to share and promote the, the good news that different federations are doing. And I think Elena's example was probably one of the, the best uh, ones uh, so far as, as following a following a tournament in terms of them realizing the the commitment and passion and ensuring that that role was created within the, the association there but also now within south america there's a, a lot of awareness um for accessibility within stadiums um and something that we're we're trying to obviously promote uh, and support uh, the work that CAFE do as well within those different regions and I think that's something that we also understand quite broadly is that we can't do it alone. We definitely need these stakeholders uh, to support us and to teach us and to guide us um, and to, to promote the, the work of accessibility within the, the different regions. So I think that's definitely one to watch going forward. I know Joanna's working in the area and we're excited to see what comes out of that. Um, but there's uh, the, the sustainability strategies that we share as well. When we leave uh, the host country, those will be the actions and those will be the improvements that have been made um, going forward. And that's something in terms of the legacy that we want to see. We're still early in the journey uh, and we'll get to, to probably see a lot more uh, great cases going forward, especially as not just we go into uh, uh, Qatar or even the uh, Australia and New Zealand, but going to America, Canada and Mexico will be another big care for us and to, to see the best practice that comes out of that. But we're constantly learning um, and we can share and promote the, the best practice stories that are following up. Great. No, great. Definitely. And, and now another question. This one comes from David Steerton, who, who, who is working with IFSA, promoting blind football around the world. And David first gives the congratulations to, to the way how FIFA is working to, to turn their tournaments more accessible and, and inclusive. And, and then David leaves a question that is, when and how will FIFA incorporate concerted efforts to make football more accessible and inclusive for footballers with disabilities? I think that links to what I said at the, the beginning um, in terms of different regions are at different stages. Uh, and it's being able to support the different regions in the, the disciplines of football uh, that they have there. And I think what there's across maybe 11 uh, disciplines of para football. So each of them as well would uh, needs development and needs support. And it's something that's in our pipeline. It's something that we're thinking about and it's something that we're working on uh, going forward. So again, not I can't say 
everything, but there's uh, things to support national associations to ensure the participation of disabled people within football um, and to give them opportunities as well to develop their skills um, and to turn this into uh, competitive as well. Um, and really make sure that it's not just a, a quick win or a, a festival that happens, but something that is uh, uh, that is sustainable and that can be uh, even once that one person uh, that has the passion and commitment to run things is gone is something that is embedded within the national association, um, and that they also have the right support to deliver it to make sure that it's long lasting, um, rather just than a one off event. Great, no, great. Great. And one more question. This one comes from Pedro, Pedro Hernandez. And the question that Pedro Hernandez asks is, how do you coordinate with other international uh, sports federations? For example, is there, he even asks, is there any uh, coordination or coordination or partnership with, for example, with the World Rugby and the R Rugby World Cup? And if there is here any knowledge sharing with other sports on this side also? So we work in sports, which is naturally a very competitive uh, area and industry. And we're always looking across different uh, events, across different organizations to see uh, what learnings we can take, uh, what things we can uh, enhance as well, and also to celebrate the successes as well. And um, so definitely uh, we look across, but there is an informal group between the different uh, bodies that we check in with each other to ensure that we're supporting each other and if that uh, one has learned something or has uh, best practice, is sharing it with the rest to make sure that we're bringing everyone together. So it's not just uh, promoting uh, opportunities for disabled people within football, but it's across sport in general. So we have uh, informal contacts with IOC, the IPC, um, and, and we try to support each other as much as possible, uh, not just with the participation, but with, uh, like I said, my specific uh, area is the, the infrastructure and the services to ensure that the spectators, the athletes, the coaches, the workforce, they can all have an inclusive uh, uh, environment to, to be able to enjoy the, the game in. So definitely, yes. Uh, and if, you, if there is anybody that wants to reach out to, to share the best practice, to share learnings, uh, we're not perfect by any means. And it's something that we want to keep evolving, keep learning and keep pushing. But if there is any contact or links that, that want to support in doing that, then more than happy to, to hear from them. Great. No, great. Definitely. And one more question here. This one comes from Badu Zaman, who is from Bangladesh. And his question is, is if FIFA has any specific guidelines for developing countries like Bangladesh to ensure stadium accessibility there? So this is what's coming. This is in terms oh. of the football stadium <laughs> guidelines uh, for the infrastructure. So no good question. Uh, probably just uh, a little bit more patience and uh, in terms of the national associations as they're building, as they're refurbishing, as they're uh, making the, the stadiums, the designs, looking into the designs. It's something that we can support with, whether it's guidelines or checklists, uh, something that's in the pipeline. And as well, training is, is something that's very key for us and that we're working with different organizations. That's from the stadium aspect of things, but in terms of also the, the workforce, um, it's something that we're keen to, to really push forward. And I know that you guys, in terms of Football for All, are doing a, a good job in that. So it's not to duplicate the work that you do, but to support the work that you do as well uh, and to recognize the efforts in this field. Thank you. And no, and, and great question already. One step, and it's good that that you that you are thinking on on the world as the global in a global perspective. And here, one more question. So we are having many many questions, and if we cannot answer to all of them, I'm sorry, but we still have a few more minutes. So, but when one more, this question comes from Jochen Kemmer, who who is also project manager at um, at Cafe and is in charge of the DAO networking group in, in Europe. And the question that, that Jochen asks is if, if you have any statistics on disabled people employed at FIFA or, or in FIFA tournaments, so here mainly World Cups, and if you have any further information on your activities towards disability inclusive employment. Yeah, in terms of the, the statistics off the top of my head, I would have to, to get back to you. Um, definitely in terms of the, the workforce um, and the World Cups. Uh, and that's something I can share with, with Jochen uh, offline or with you guys to share at a later time. Um, and in terms of uh, 
recruitment forward for disabled people. Uh, we have the Women's Football Development Programme, which focuses on gender equality, but not gender equality alone. It looks at different uh, aspects of equality as well and characteristics to ensure that it's an intersectional approach. So that's one way. But another way is to also address, like I said before, the, the recruitment processes and procedures that we have and to, to work and support the, the work that you guys are doing. I mean, you guys are already have a, a, a base, uh, a good... Uh, knowledge in terms of the, the different people. And I think in a few weeks you have uh, the webinars with ex-participants who have succeeded and gained employment within football as well. So those are the, the types of networks that it's important for us to, to target in terms of our roles and opportunities to ensure that people understand that they exist um, and to support, identify and understand where we can support or where we can improve to ensure that more people are applying. And when they do apply, when they come into to their roles, that they're comfortable uh, and happy in a happy working environment as well. I mean, uh, you probably know uh, my chief uh, within FIFA, my direct working chief, she is uh, an ambassador of Football for All, a Joyce. wheelchair user herself, Joyce Cook, uh, and she's very passionate and very adamant about this topic as well. Um, and is working very hard. To, we're working together to ensure that that's also considered. No, definitely. And, and thank you. Thank you also for, for the positive words about the Football for All Leadership Program. It's great to see your support also here. And by the way, the, the session, just the session, we'll have a session with former participants of the program that will take place on the 30th of November. So a little bit more than one month. And it will be also a great session where we'll, our participants will share a little bit how the program impacted their lives and, and also what are their expectations and how they are developing their, their professional career in the, the, sports, the sports industry. And one more, one more question here that, um, that, I'm, that, I have, that I have for you. This one comes from Matt Greenwood. And does, does a member association hosting a FIFA event have to include an accessibility plan for the event and a legacy strategy for the post event? And if you have any good examples that you could share with us, I know that you already shared a few a few examples, but yeah, still here. So in terms of uh, for the Women's World Cup and the, the Men's World Cup, we usually have a sustainability strategy. Uh, and that's once the, the host is appointed, then we work with the joint venture or the local entity to develop a strategy to ensure that sustainability and accessibility as part of that uh, is included and is considered um, it's also along with different topics like anti-discrimination and human rights and the wider environment as well. Um, but that's something that we would do that once the, the host is appointed. Uh, in the bid stages, uh, I think it's something that we definitely ask for. We ask for information in terms of how a, a host country or a host city, uh, uh, what accessibility provision they already have, what legislation they have, what policies, what procedures. Um, and we also have our accessibility requirements that they would have to, they need to understand and declare that they would be willing to, to meet as well. So it's definitely a key part of, uh, of going into a, a country and choosing even selecting the, the stadiums or the cities um, and the tournaments. So it's something that's quite positive, but the, the strategy usually comes as a joint initiative that we work on together um, and we understand the setting in the country um, and we, we understand from them what would be a good legacy for them um, and we support there as well. And the, in terms of examples, is you, you can have a look at the, the Russia uh, sustainability strategy, the Qatar sustainability strategy is already out um, and then keep your eyes open for any future ones. Great, definitely, no, def very, very good. And, and here, my, my next, the next question that we have here comes from Gabriel Meyer, who, who is working with the, the United Nations. And, and his question is, how does FIFA work with the employability of people with disabilities in, in the events and in the organization itself? Is it encouraged? And are any, do you have any indicators also about it? Do you have? So, for, for Qatar, for example, it's something definitely that we're incorporating. For Russia, we already saw the, the different groups that we worked with uh, and the different individuals that we worked with there. But it's something that we maintain and we do encourage going forward. Um, we're very keen to, to have uh, applications from different volunteers or even for the employability, the workforce, 
um, and that's why key key topics or key events like this are important for us to to have the opportunity to to speak to to people to let them know that there are opportunities available um, and if people do need support to to let us know as well um, and again it's also on us to make sure that our recruitment processes and procedures are also accommodating um, and also encouraging for for anybody to to apply to us um, and if there's ways that we can do that we're uh, we're more than open to, to understanding how and why um, uh, specific things should be done in a specific way because we don't want to just do it for the sake of doing it. We under, want to understand why we should be doing it. So it's learning that we can take for, for future events, for future projects, for future initiatives, future uh, uh, vacancies as well. So um, internally at FIFA, I think that's, that's it's something that's really important that we have to also do the training and the capacity building and awareness for the, the departments that uh, recruit somebody with a disability, for example, to also understand the, the needs and to be able to, to provide a good experience as well. Great, no, great. And, and my next, our next question comes from, from Ghana, from Anthony Asante, who is at the Cape, Cape Coast School for the Deaf and Blind in, in Ghana. And the question of, of Anthony is if, Concerning like the current pandemic that we are that we are living, living, um, if if are there any upcoming projects to educate more on COVID-19 and as well as their positive development? So I suppose here COVID-19 from the perspective of disabled people and how this can a little bit influence influence our society. I mean, I think that's a very uh, topical question and uh, something that we're all trying to to learn and understand and deal with in this situation of COVID. It's something that I'll definitely check with our member associations department or FIFA foundation in terms of specific projects. But um, I guess uh, the wider COVID question is it's, it's an opportunity for all of us to, to maybe take a pause and think about how we're doing things um, and to think about how we can improve things as well, especially from uh, an accessibility point of view. And that's whether we're having the, the infrastructure for the tournaments or the services or the employability um, and uh, even hosting uh, games just in normal time. I know, Josie, you went to Portugal game yes, uh, a few true. weeks ago. <laughs> and I don't know in terms of your experience and how you found uh, COVID, COVID to be in the changes there. I thought, to be honest, I'm, I found... I found safe and I found the match was quite well organized by the by the Portuguese Football Association and by also by the, the National Health um, Service here in Portugal. And of course, it's a different experience, like it's, it's different when you are accustomed to be in a stadium full of people and suddenly you are you are alone and in a space of, of 10 chairs in front and 10 chairs on each side, um, you don't have anyone. So it's a, it's a different experience and the stadium has 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 less people but to be honest I'm I felt quite safe also the match was a was a good experience Portugal won that also contributed but but from per, telling from the perspective more from a health perspective like I remember we we, we needed to see the the fever before entering in the stadium also we needed to put cream um, in in the hands before and I think like it was quite well organized. For example, there are a little different procedures. For example, normally we were used to, to leave all the stadium at, at the same time. And there was even a big concentration of people in the, in, the, in, the, in the tunnel that takes you to outside of the stadium. And this time, like the security guards, they, they, they allowed people to like to, to leave like every, in each row. So you could only leave when the row uh, in front of you had 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 already left, and um, and I I felt quite safe. Of course, what you were with with mask inside. It's it's a different experience, and I I think that today we might not be still prepared to to have the stadiums with 100% full capacity, even because the virus is still quite strong, unfortunately. But but at least I I felt that in terms of procedures and in terms of match planning and in terms of of safety like the, the experience was good. Of course, then there are things that you can, net, you can never avoid because it's the natural, the, natu the, the natural part of the human beings. Like when it's a goal, you always have the tendency <laughs> to shake the hands of, even if you, are, we don't, you don't have anyone in the, in the chair exactly near you, you always have the tendency to, to, to give a hug or to, or to, or to, 
or to or to just shake hands with the person that that is closest to you but of course i think here it also depends a little bit from us and i think we all need to make to make an effort and even and this is quite difficult for for people who feel quite a lot the match as i recognize yeah. it's my case but i think we need to adapt a little bit to the circumstances and and we need to to feel think that before maybe even if i really want to to give a hug to the person that is closest to me in the stadium i think even more than giving a hug i don't want that to to pass potentially a virus or any mm. illness to this person so so i think it's it's also it one side i think it's it's on the 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 match the the the, the people the organizations who are who are organizing the match so in this case was the fa who need to the fa also the national health service who need to make sure that that the city that the procedures work well but then i think it's also important that ourselves as fans we we need to to make an effort and and maybe maybe if 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 your team scores a goal you don't you 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 shouldn't run to the person near the stadium but you you can just you can still celebrate and and say hello like 10 meters away and and then of course we we all hope that when they this pandemic will pass and then and it will be good but at least it's a starting point already to be back to the stadiums and yeah and it was a good experience particularly for someone that here i cannot hide that really likes football and that's really like <laughs> the, the live the live atmosphere of the stadium so, yeah. no and i think that will definitely be a challenge for all of us as we go back we obviously have qatar uh, happening in two years and hopefully by that time by things that, will be better <laughs> But there's still things that we have to consider in terms of whether we have any blind spectators and if there's braille in terms of signage and how they would touch the walls and the exactly. hygiene exactly. aspect of that or even the the signage will be so important in terms of wayfinding for for color blind to ensure that we have also uh the right contrast or the the contrast nosing as well to to, to support supporters um, but it's something that we're really going to have to to look into to understand. And I think Cafe also has the the survey results uh, recently. They they asked about uh, supporters and how they felt uh, about COVID or the the health and safety. So that's something we can look at um, and also uh, all work together. I think that's the key point here exactly. is that none of us are can do this alone. Uh, we all really need to to work together in in the COVID time and beyond the COVID times. Exactly. No, and 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 I think collaboration also here is 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 key on the on this case on on this one and on many others. But in particular here, I think like either the either FIFA, either the FAs, either the I think here the national health services also have a really really key key factor here, and and then of course the people because we we don't live alone. We live in community, and and I think. First of all, we should always think on the, the common common goods, the, the best, like on, on having every safe and also not thinking only on us, but on everyone in general. And and my, my last here, the last question that we have here, sorry to the people that eventually they, we couldn't answer to all the questions, but our 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 time is reaching to to an end and 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 we unfortunately we we couldn't answer to all the questions but but still thank you for for making them and and we promise that every webinar we try to to answer to the most questions possible and the last question here comes from nandini vijay kumar from from india and the question is if fifa somehow um inter uses like able bodied players so here mainstream football players to talk about inclusion of disabled people so if somehow you you see like them the mainstream players as as ambassadors for 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 this cause i think uh, in general uh, equality diversity and inclusion is a key topic uh, across uh, for everyone uh, we've seen it recently in terms of Black Lives Matter. It's, it's also white players that are, are talking about the need and importance for, for those things to be addressed. Um, and I think it's only a positive thing to not just uh, leave it to the minorities to, to shout about the problems and to, to work on the problems, but it's really the, the role of allies to support uh, minorities and underrepresented groups to ensure that they are supporting and they're helping to, to raise awareness of the topic, but also to, to work together to find solutions. 
um, and to, to implement those solutions as well. So that's something that I can only see as a, as a positive thing, something that we would encourage as well, um, and something that we could potentially look into going forward. Great. No, because of course, like this mainstream either men and nowadays even more and more women football players, they definitely are, are influencers in our community. You see probably the people with with more followers in social media are football <laughs> players. So so they can definitely be also ambassadors for good and in particular for this cause that is inclusion of disabled people. They can definitely have also a positive impact here. And unfortunately, we like we are coming to an end and I, I think there will be there will be topics to be we'll have in we could be here talking for much more time because this I think even if this session is coming to an end this topic of inclusion of disabled people in football is far away from from coming to to an end and I think it's always always good it's also it's always something that should be talked and we we should never forget this and 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 as Ala mentioned a, a few minutes ago like cooperation and collaboration is, is really a key here and it's great to see the, the main governing body in football FIFA being open here to talk about these topics and to see so many different organizations interacting and so many different questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer to all them and so so many people participating from, from all around the world. And before leaving, I will just like to, to share the results of the, um, of, the, um, of the survey that we launched on the beginning of the, of the session. And here, the, ses the results are the following. I think you can see, so all the options <laughs> mentioned above win <laughs> with a large distance. Then we also have stadium accessibility with 16%, um, employment of, of disabled people with 12%, disabled football with 9%, and support NGOs working in the area with 7%, but I, I think here people definitely say that, that all, all these areas are, are important, are somehow important. And, and before, uh, before like announcing our next session that will take next place next Monday, I'll just like to say a special thank you to Ala. Thank you very much, Ala, for, for, for giving your time today and for, for being available to share a little bit your work in this area and, and also what, what you and FIFA are doing to turn football more inclusive and, and, and accessible to everyone. And I don't know, Al, if you would like just to say some conclusion words, but from our, from our side, a huge thank you for, for joining us today. Thank you. A huge thank you to you, Josie, and the team as well in the background who have made this possible in terms of inviting me to the webinar to, to share uh, the, the experiences, our specific experiences. And I think the, the poll it was a trick question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, all of the options mentioned above. But again, to go back to the point that, yes, all of the points mentioned above, but we can't do it alone. And that's why it's key to have the collaboration um, and to have the, the learning and knowledge uh, from all the key stakeholders and from everyone tuned in to, to help and guide us on the journey. Um, and if we all work together, then I think it, it makes it easier and it makes it better um, in the long run and more sustainable um, and something that we can advance in together. So thanks for this opportunity as well and look forward to working together. No, thank you, Wes. Thank you again, Ala. Thank you. And and before leaving, I will just like to I will just like to share with you our our next episode that will be that will take place uh, that will take place um, next Monday and um, so November November the second, and that will have as main topics how can inclusion be an open door for for innovation and and here I'm I'm very much looking forward for this session first because I think. Here we we in this area definitely we have a door for for the future and I, and I think here like talking here a little bit even from my experience I I learn every day with the participants of the football for all leadership program and from our from our different projects even with these webinars I'm I've been learning a lot and 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 I think that in this area we definitely have have a long way to and a big opportunity to to improve the world and, and to turn our future brighter. And, and we'll have with us um, Katie Pearl, who is the conversation design lead at Google. We'll have Miguel Neva, who was the founder of Color Ed, that was the, the first um, color, color identification system for colorblind people. 
Then we'll have Peter and Kate Shippe from the Shippe's campaign who introduced, who introduced the concept of sensorial rooms in, in football stadiums and in sports venues in, in general. And then we have Matthew, Matthew Walzer. Matthew is, is a change maker, is, a, is, is the really good example of a, of a change maker. And M Matthew, um, ju just as a way to create some expectation for, for, for next week, I can say that Matthew uh, convinced it like some very well-renowned brands such as Nike and as Tommy Hilfiger to turn their project pro products uh, inclusive for their disabled people, for disabled people, and for disabled customers. So, so I think it will definitely it will definitely worth it, and it will be next week. Will be one hour before, so will be by 5 p.m. British Standard Time and 6 p.m. Central European time. And registrations are open, it's for free, and we are very much looking forward to welcoming you all again in, in one week. And thank you again to, to all of you. Thank you very much, Hala, for, for joining us today. And, and thank you, and I think we definitely come out here with, um, with the idea that we cannot stop in this, in this in promoting inclusion and in change trying to change the world into a better place. Thank you very much to all of you and looking forward to seeing you soon again in, in, in one week, hopefully, for this webinar. Thank you.